Good afternoon. Today, I'm talking about seven interesting facts on intellectual property. Number one, patent trolls. Patent trolls are non-practicing entities that acquire patent portfolios of broad use in order to threaten to sue normal companies who produce remotely similar patented products. The trolls file for generic patents with the sole purpose, if a company comes up with a similar discovery that kind of resembles the troll patent later on, they will go to court and sue them in order to get money from them. The trolls have no interest in developing or manufacturing the product. The only thing that they want is to settle the case with the companies that they have the legitimate patents out of the court for money. Most companies that they are sued by the trolls, they end up settling or paying licensing fees to the trolls. This is because of two reasons. First, because of fear of high litigation fees, because the trolls are actually law firms that that's their job to take people to court in order to settle. And secondly, because in some cases they might even lose the case at court and they will end up paying huge damages to those trolls. The cost of patent trolling for the economy turns out to be huge. A study of 2011 actually estimated the cost of patent trolling to above $25 billion. Number two, when is a trademark infringed? In other words, what is the degree of resemblance that is needed for a court to award that your trademark has been infringed by someone else? The general rule that the courts go by is that if an average consumer who buys with average caution is likely to be confused by the trademark or the package or something that resembles your intellectual property, then in this case it's considered infringed. There are three main criteria that the courts base their decisions on. The first one is the actual degree of resemblance. Do the two products look alike? The second thing that they look is the actual occurrence of confusion. The third is the intent. If the person who designed the logo or the package second had an intention to steal customers from the first one. Number three, protection from trademark blaring. This is when the law protects the companies from what we call dilution because of blurring. Dilution because of blurring happens when another company uses a similar or even the same logo with yours in a different business in order to capture some of the recognition that comes from your business. Like for example, someone is selling Apple tractors. Everyone knows that these tractors are not made by Apple, but if you use the same logo, maybe you will attend a lot of attention for the other product. So therefore, the law doesn't really allow that. It protects you against blurring. Number four, protection from trademark tarnishment. Trademark tarnishment is when a similar brand name or even the same is used by another company in a way that causes damages to the reputation of your company. Consider, for example, someone who makes Microsoft toilet seats. That's not going to be very good for the name of Microsoft. Or someone who fixes Ford cars and has this logo. Or an institute of weight loss that has this logo. Or someone who has a coffee shop and runs with this logo here. Or even someone else who runs, a, let's say, lung cancer uh, hospital and has this logo right there. So this cannot be done because of protection from trademark tarnishment. Number five, the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization that protects intellectual property at a worldwide level. The WIPO was created in 1893 after the Bern Convention to encourage creative activity to promote the protection of intellectual property throughout the world. In 1967, WIPO became one 
of the 17 specialized agencies of the United Nations. Currently, it has 189 member countries and it's headquartered in Geneva. The most important limitation of WIPO is it doesn't have enforcing power. Even today, still, most of the cases, they go through the World Trade Organization who does have a little bit of power to enforce in case of international violations of treaties on trade and intellectual property. Number six is the TRIPS agreement. That is the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. It is an international agreement between the World Trade Organization nations and it was signed in 1994. The TRIPS agreement sets the minimum international standards that national governments have to follow when they make local regulations about the forms of intellectual property. The TRIPS internationalized the trademarks, so now if you have a trademark in one country, this trademark automatically it can be transferred to another country. It also protected geographical indications. For example, you cannot buy champagne wine unless it's from the Champagne region of France. And that is the reason why nowadays we call what we used to call before champagne only as sparkling wine. Other examples are feta cheese that has, of course, to be from Greece. Greek yogurt that also has to be from Greece. Cuban cigars that they also have to be from, no, they have to be from Cuba, and also Swiss chocolate and several other geographical indicated products. And finally, number seven is the DMCA. The DMCA is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It's a United States law, but which also has international influence. The reason is that a vast majority of intellectual property comes, resides, or has interests in the United States. The DMCA is an act that protects from liability from intellectual property violations in four different cases. The first is when you are a mere provider of internet signal. In other words, you just provide the infrastructure for internet and you have no liability for what goes through the internet cables that you provide to your users. The second is when you are caching information, like for example Google or Facebook does. In other words, you keep copies into your hard drives so you will provide easier access to your users. The third is when they are mere hosts of user content. In other words, you do not provide the content, you just host it. In this case, it's YouTube and Dropbox that I can think of an example. The fourth case is when you just index the page. That is, you go and you keep some notes, some, some tags on the specific web pages in order to have fast access for searching them. This is what all search engines are doing. So in this case, you are also protected. These entities that they are under these four protected categories that we just said, they are called safe harbors. However, if someone notifies a safe harbor that there is illegal content go through their infrastructure or through their method, they are required by the DMCA to drop it as soon as possible.